about to launch into the next amazing part of God's narrative, his true account of who he is and of what he is about. We have already covered the, the first part of that narrative, not every detail, but touching on key events and characters and tracing the important threads that led up to the coming of Jesus, the Savior. We also took an overview of the remarkable accounts of Jesus' life and work that culminated in his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, as we've heard, he returned to his Father in heaven, but the narrative is by no means over. Everything before Jesus was leading up to him, and everything afterward can be said to flow out from him. He is the central point of history, and nothing can be truly understood if it doesn't take him into account. We can be very grateful that God made sure we would have a record of what took place in the days, months, and years after Jesus left the earth. It was written, of course, by Luke, one of Jesus' four official biographers, official in the sense that they were appointed by God. Later on, in a reference by a colleague and traveling companion, we find out that Luke was a doctor. The account he penned of what took place as Jesus' followers reached out with the good news would become known as Acts of the Apostles, or simply Acts. A more accurate name might be the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. It's possible to see a reflection of Luke's medical training and the methodical way he draws together his own and other eyewitness accounts of events. It is an accurate record of events which would have and, and still are having an enormous historical significance for the world. So Acts is historical, but if we only see it as history, even church history, at least if by that we mean dry facts and figures about events long past, then we miss out on the enormously important and relevant lessons that we can glean. Or maybe it becomes just another Bible book, a compilation of detached texts and devotional readings. It's easy to forget that this is a true story about real people in, in actual places who faced challenges very similar to ours and who were given resources that we also have available to us. Or else it gets reduced to a list of references and sermons and lectures and youth group talks. Nothing wrong with proof texts, bullet points and PowerPoint slides, just so long as we remember that Acts is the record of some of the most exciting and far-reaching things that have ever happened on this planet. But these are not just fascinating things that happened a long time ago in a distant place to some other people. This is, in fact, our story, our history. It's where we can find out what makes us, us, if you like. Not that we want to spend our time navel-gazing, as the saying goes, introspectively obsessed with ourselves, but aligning our view of ourselves with who God says we are moves us a long way toward actually being that, being those people, being and doing what he designed us for. There are many elements to the mosaic that forms our individual sense of identity, a lot of layers that add up to the picture we have of ourselves. These are put in place often without us noticing by our experiences of our families, our friends, our formative environment, uh, the people we've mixed with in our lives, the larger culture and its media and so on. But when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we were born again. We, we became, in, in the most fundamental ways, new people. So what is our identity in light of that? How does this new identity fit in with or perhaps conflict with the ways we've always seen ourselves and been seen by others. Because this issue of identity is so very important, when we followed God's narrative for the first time, we highlighted those parts that helped us understand who God is. Then in light of that, we looked at who we are in our natural state as his fallen, corrupted race of image bearers. But then, in our second brief overview, we focused a lot of our attention on who God says we are now, as those who've been restored to a relationship with Him through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. As we move ahead into the Acts narrative, this new identity is clarified further as we observe the beginnings of a new entity that joins together all those who are His people under the new covenant, His united people, our church.
So this is not cold, sterile theology, but relevant and exciting realities that relate directly to how we see ourselves, how we view others who also believe, and how we relate to the rest of the human race. Something directly related to the inception of this new entity is the arrival and ongoing role of the Holy Spirit. His presence will prove, in the course of the narrative, to be so integrated into the lives of believers, individually and as a group, that it's not possible to think of them without including him. They are who they are because he is who he is. But it is not just their story, as we have already said. This is also our story because he connects us with the rest of God's family across space and also through time. His presence in the Acts narrative links it directly and personally with our 21st century narratives. Another important transition was also taking place, but it's one that, on the face of it, we might wrongly assume is not all that relevant to our daily lives. Something just of academic interest to theologians. As we know, the Old Covenant was made between God and a particular ethnic group who were the descendants of one man, Abraham. Now another covenant had replaced it. This one initiated through Jesus' blood through his death. And this one would not be defined by ethnicity or ancestry at all, but by faith and by the Holy Spirit. Of course, as the Acts narrative records, this created tensions between those still clinging on the old covenant paradigm and those who were clearly seeing the implications of the new. But why should we find these threads in the narrative interesting and how does all this relate to us in very different places and centuries later? Well, for one thing, even though we might not face pressure to go to the temple and sacrifice like the early Jewish Christians did, the underlying principles are still relevant. It's important for us to know, as New Covenant people, how we should view God's law that he gave with the Old Covenant, how free are we under this new agreement, or should we be trying to follow the law? From the Acts account of the first believer's journey answering these questions, we get important insights about how we should approach large chunks of the Old Testament narrative and also clues about how God wants us to live today. During this inaugural and transitional period, the Holy Spirit was also guiding some of Luke's co-workers to write what, along with Acts and the Gospels, would become God's revelation for the New Covenant, the compilation of books that in English we refer to as the New Testament. A lot of it, as we know, is in the form of extensive, carefully written letters. Epistles is the older English term that has stuck, sent to individuals and groups of believers. Luke's history is important to us because it gives us important background details that help us understand the specific contexts, problems and questions the different authors had in mind as they wrote. Even though we might reach for an electronic device instead of a papyrus scroll to access the truths written down by the apostles, and even though our 21st century lives might look very different from what the first generation of believers faced, the Acts narrative makes it clear that the challenges are basically the same. And so that's one reason we want to look at this now. It sets the stage for the, the rest of God's narrative contained in the, the New Testament and shows us that God's revelation is not abstract theory, but real encouragement and real guidance for his children, no matter when or where they're on this earth. Another reason all this is compelling for us is because the changes under the new covenant launched the gospel's outward journey from its Jewish Jerusalem source out along the roads and shipping routes of the Roman Empire through the medium of the, the Greek language that was so widespread transported out by the apostles, of course, but also by Silk Road merchants, incense traders, sailors, Roman soldiers, slaves, itinerant workers, and, and animal herders. The good news, unleashed by a potent combination of Jesus' authority, the Spirit's empowerment, and his people's obedience, broke down cultural and linguistic barriers wherever it went. It began to draw people who didn't look at all Jewish, who spoke strange languages and whose food was anything but kosher, uh, 
This outward impetus of the gospel that Luke records for us, and it spread to the non-Jewish peoples, the Gentiles in the areas dominated by the Roman Empire, would continue on and eventually bring it to us. But as significant as that is for each of us personally, there's a lot more to the picture than how we have benefited. The task is not completed. What began then is still going on. The Holy Spirit is still challenging and equipping his people to complete the work the apostles began. One of the most prominent characters in Luke's story about the apostles and the early church was a man called Paul. After his traumatic conversion, this former enemy of anything or anyone promoting the new covenant would go on to be its greatest advocate. Some of what Luke writes are his first-hand accounts. A blog might be today's equivalent of, of traveling around the Mediterranean area with Paul and others looking for opportunities to tell people the good news. God has provided a way back to himself through his own son who lived recently in Palestine, was crucified by the Romans, but who now lives again as the rightful ruler of the world. When some from towns like Ephesus or Corinth or an area like Galatia came to faith in Jesus Christ, Paul and friends would gather them together and share the whole of God's narrative with them. As they were equipped with truth, these groups of people develop a sense of corporate identity as distinct groups within the larger community. They grew stronger in the faith and could utilize the skills, abilities, and insights given to them as a group by the Holy Spirit. They were also increasingly able to care for their own needs as a body of believers, to worship the Lord, to feed themselves from His Word, and to be His witness in their immediate communities and beyond. And so a pattern was established, a model that would look different in, in form from place to place, but would remain unchanged in its essence and function. So as we trace the Acts account of how Paul and the other apostles went about fulfilling the task Jesus had entrusted to them, we can glean invaluable insights into how we should be going about that same task today. And by seeing their commitment, their passion, and their willingness to sacrifice for the sake of their master, we're inspired to do the same.